everybody. I am sitting here sweating bullets. I'm sitting here a little bit nervous because today we're going to be talking to two of the baddest brothers on the planet. Polymaths is what I consider them to be. We're doing our first Black World Media Network show in partnership with Digital Mind State, which means that this interview will go all over the world several times around. So I'm really, really, really excited. And Dr. Jeffrey Robinson and Dr. Randall Pinkett, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy life to do this very, very important show uh, with us. I could spend 25% of this interview on your resume and on your background. And when I say I consider you both to be polymaths, which are multi-geniuses, it is a compliment to Imhotep, the first multi-genius in the history of the world. And um, so I'm going to just take a moment and try to do a dramatic short read of your backgrounds, because our audience should know the greatness that is sitting before us. Dr. Randall Pinkett has established himself as an entrepreneur, speaker, author, and scholar. He is the co-founder and chairman and CEO of BCT Partners, a global multi-million dollar research training, consulting technology, and data analytics firm. BCT's mission is to provide insight about diverse people that lead to equity. The company has been recognized by Forbes as one of America's best management consultant firms. Ernst & Young as the EY Entrepreneur of the Year, uh, Manage HR Magazine as one of the top uh, 10 firms for diversity and inclusion and Black Enterprise BE100's list of the nation's largest African-American owned businesses and the Inc. 5000 list for the fastest growing private companies in America. Dr. Pinkett is an expert in several areas relating to emerging technologies, big data analytics, social innovation, culture, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and is a regular contributor to MSNBC, CNN, and Fox Business News. He holds five academic degrees in electrical engineering, computer science, and business administration from Rutgers, Oxford, and MIT. Now, he has a partner, a brother that he has been with a long, long time. I believe they met in college who is every bit as brilliant as he is. So here, one plus one doesn't make two. One plus one here makes 11. Dr. Jeffrey A. Robinson, also a polymath, is an award-winning business school professor, international speaker, and entrepreneur. Since 2008, he has been a leading faculty member at Rutgers Business School, where he is the prudential chair in business and the academic director of uh, director of the Center for Urban Entrepreneurship and Economic Development and director of special programs uh, of the Rutgers Advanced Institute for the Study of Entrepreneurship and Development. Through his research, business leadership and community activities, he makes direct impact on corporate workplaces, entrepreneurs, and economic development policy in the state of New Jersey and beyond. Dr. Robinson also has completed five degrees in the areas of engineering, urban studies, and business at Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. He completed a Bachelor's of Art in Urban Studies at Rutgers and a Bachelor's of Science in Civil Engineering at Rutgers School of Engineering. He has a Master's of Science in Civil Engineering Management from Georgia Institute of Technology and as a GEM Fellow. And he has uh, a Master's in Philosophy and a PhD in Management and Organizations from Columbia University Graduate School of Business. Wow. You have decided to write 
a second version of a book that you wrote a first version on 11 years ago, Black Faces and in High Places. Dr. Pinkett, this is not your first book with the same title. Why was there a need to write another book more than a decade later after you wrote your bestseller, Black Faces in White Places. Why was there a need to do that? Well, first, George, thank you for uh, Dr. Frazier, AKA George, thank you for the, the humbling introduction and for the kind words. What your audience may or may not know is that uh, you have been a, a role model and an icon to us long before we knew you. <laughs> right. uh, and, I've, and I've said affectionately that we, we borrowed some of your material back when we were younger <laughs> without, without you quite knowing. <laughs> uh, for some of, the, some of the, the, tra the trainings we were doing on networking decades and decades ago. So I, I won't belabor the point other than to say it is uh, an honor. It is a, a coming of circle. It's a coming of age. Right. And, and it, is, uh, it is humbling that uh, I know I speak for Dr. Robinson when I say this, that we are, uh, we are here in your presence uh, because when we say uh, colloquially that we stand on the shoulders of giants, I say this, that to say, we stand on your shoulders as our giant. And so I wanna just begin by paying honor and homage to, to you before we even get into questions. Yeah, now, one uh, other point I wanna make. You are also brothers and sisters, chairman that's of right. all things FraserNet. That's right. And you and Dr. Robinson, it might have been three and a half years ago in your offices in New Jersey. That's right. Did our master business plan. <laughs> so I love you for that. And that's just payback for what you stole from me. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm glad you took touché. it. Touche, touche, touche. And, and I love you more. I love you more, George. Thank you. Um, a right. uh, dear friend and a brother to me. Um, so, so why this book and why now? Uh, which is a, a, a great question. As you said, we wrote Black Faces in High Places more than a decade ago. And at the time, we wanted to highlight our experiences and that of others, uh, Black professionals who have found themselves as one of the few or the only one. We've all been there. We've all had that experience. And if you haven't, you haven't been living long enough, you will have that experience. That's right. <laughs> uh, That's right. but, then, but, but, but then think about this, and, and you'll appreciate this, George. When we wrote that book, President Obama was in office. We had visions of society's evolution to becoming more egalitarian, more inclusive. Uh, we talked about Workforce 2000 and its diversity, and, and that was decades into the browning of America, and it was a much different atmosphere than now. Now we find ourselves in the post-Trump era, we find our, or, or, or for all we know, maybe the pre-Trump two era, mm -hmm. we find ourselves in the post-George Floyd era, we find ourselves, I can't say post-pandemic, but we know we're post the declaration of the pandemic, mm -hmm. and so we're in a whole new atmosphere which has given rise all those, all those dynamics, Trump, George Floyd, and COVID have all elevated our conversation about Black leadership. The dearth in the White House, the need in response to George Floyd, and the disparities and inequities facing our communities in light of COVID. And so Dr. Robinson and I have been, we've been joking about writing a sequel for quite some time now, but on the heels of those societal dynamics and trends, we said now is the time because now more than ever, Black leadership matters. Amen. As the old saying says, if the fish stinks, look to the head. <laughs> it's leadership. If we find ourselves going backwards, it's leadership. Yes. It's leadership. Um, Dr. Robinson, um, what should readers 
expect from this second version of maybe one of the most important topics as it relates to Black people in this country? What should they expect? Well, first of all, I, I just want to echo what Dr. Pinkett said about you. And we do appreciate you know, being on the show and being with you and, and learning from you over the years. You know, th this book is an extension of uh, some of the lessons we learned from people like you uh, and other other leaders of different sectors of business and entrepreneurship and nonprofits. We interviewed a bunch of people you know, 12 years ago, and, and in many ways, we were able to see their arc of their, of their trajectory over that time. And there's lessons we can derive from, from what they said. And so what we uh, endeavored to do was to uh, create a roadmap, uh, a roadmap on how to get to the top, and mm -hmm. then not just get to the top, but stay there. I mean, those are, <laughs> those are not... Those are, those are two different things because we, we know people who have made it to the top and have had challenges and then you know, disappear after, after a short mm -hmm. period of time. And so again, it, it, the, the way that we've organized this book after um, some very you know, strong introductory remarks about the need and the importance of, of black leadership, we get to 10 strategic actions. And, and, and to me, that's what people uh, are often commenting, even in these early days that the book has been released, that seems to be the most helpful, that we, we provide a, a, a pathway, a, a, a show them what the journey looks like, and whether they are somebody early on in their career or whether they're somebody who's been out there for a while, um, it's giving them a way to think about in a strategic way you know, what to do next, um, and whether they're trying to get to the very top of the organization or just looking for more autonomy. Um, and some more uh, self-determination of where they're going to go and how they're going to operate um, inside a company, in a, in a community, in their own business, uh, whatever their path takes them. One of my favorite quotes of all time, in a sense, the North Star of my entire life, happened to me in the early 60s, listening to Stokely Carmichael. Stokely Carmichael was to the left he was a stone cold revolutionary <laughs> and he says something for me so profound that it etched it infected affected and affected my subconscious mind and basically was the north star for my life i see much of the essence of what he said in you so I'm going to quote him exactly. I'm not going to try to paraphrase it. I'm going to quote the quote that changed or gave direction to my life. So Carmichael said in 1962, no black person in this country makes any advancement solely based on his or her talent or worth. All individual advancement is based on mass struggle. We make no progress in this world without shedding our blood. Therefore, your advancement and success does not belong to you. It belongs to the people. Hmm. And if you do not use your success or advancement for the benefit of your people, it is a betrayal of the people who shed their blood for you. Wow. <laughs> right, right. So that was a mic drop moment <laughs> early in my life and affected my entire mm. approach to my world. Mm -hmm. I see those qualities in both of you in your own way, navigating two worlds as I, when my or, or first days with Procter and Gamble for 13 years, then United Way and then Ford being one of the first and only, it really was a dual challenge. No question about that. Dr. Pinkett, who is the audience for this book? If you could wave a magic wand and get a bestseller tomorrow based on the exact audience that you want 
to read this book, who would that be? First of all, powerful quote from Stokely Carmichael. Uh, I have been affected, infected, and effected by that as well. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. Uh, I, I'm a big alliteration fan. Dr. Robinson knows this. Yeah. Uh, the perception of this book is often that it's for corporate professionals. And it is indeed for corporate professionals, but it's not just for corporate professionals. The audience includes those who aspire to navigate higher education and K through 12, the nonprofit sector and community activism, entrepreneurship and a faith-based organization. I mean, because we, we talk to people representing all of these sectors. Otis Moss III, Senator Cory Booker, Angela Glover Blackwell, uh, Ursula Burns, David Stewart. I mean, just look at the breadth of what I just offered this moment ago. Like an entrepreneur, a corporate executive, a nonprofit leader. Uh, Benjamin Jealous, from the former NAACP sure. Sure. president and CEO. So you got an activist. Uh, the list just goes on and on. I mean, even artists that we interviewed. Uh, so the book casts a uh, appropriately wider net while providing sufficiently deeper strategies to say to any black professional who desires to be in a position of influence and power. And, and uh, Dr. Robinson led the writing on a great chapter on influence and power in the book. But anyone who, who aspires to be in a position of influence and power and not find themselves ill-prepared for when they get there, because to Dr. Robinson's point, the book subtitle is not how to just get to the top, but how to stay there, then this book is for you. And this book is for you relative to what you said about Stokely Carmichael a moment ago, or what you quoted, which is understanding that you not only have levers available to you, but you should be unapologetic about pulling those levers because if you're not pulling them, nobody will, and everyone else around you is pulling theirs. That's right. That's right. Beautiful, beautifully said, powerfully said. Um, Tony Morrison said it a little bit differently. I love the late Tony Morrison. She said, if you're free, you need to free somebody else. Hmm. If you have some power, then your job is to empower somebody else, mm, mm, right? Mm. That's where you're going. That's what you're doing. That's why I'm in, in love with with the, the work that you've been doing. Both of you've been doing this. You're not you know Johnny come lately. So although you're young, but you're no Johnny come lately. Your heart has been in this work for certainly as long as I have been knowing you. So there is a there is a truth about it. There is. Um, uh, a transparency that comes through there. You keep it real, but you still keep it at a at a at a level that everybody can understand. And you're 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 pulling people up to a level that they need to understand as we go forth, as you so beautifully articulated in the beginning. Jeffrey, back to you. Um, why does black leadership matter? That's A. And B, why do we need more black faces in high places? Yeah, yeah those, those two questions are intertwined. That, <laughs> great, great question. The, right. uh, there's lots of reasons. I mean, I'm, I'm, let, me, let, me use, let me use one example, and it's a corporate example to just set the stage for, for how, how we might think about this. I mean, when you look at the Fortune 500, there are five, one, two, three, four, five. As of today, there are five black CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. You say, well, you know, that's just a bunch of other companies. Why are we worried about the Fortune 500? We're worried about the first Fortune 500 because those 500 companies uh, constitute two thirds of the gross domestic product of the United States. They are 28.5 million people uh, work for Fortune 500 companies. And you can think about the trillions of dollars that, that, they, that they make and, and all of that. And so when you have um, black people um, at the top of, of organizations like those, mm -hmm. that means there are uh, a number of things that happen. First of all, um, the, the conversation is different. 
than perhaps ha has been for the, you know, the umpteen number of uh, CEOs that were there before. Right. They can think about things in a different way. Uh, and and in, in many ways, direct resources, um, strategic resources where, where it's needed. You, you can look back at people like Ken Frazier, who just stepped down as CEO of, right. um, of, uh, of Merkin Company, um, who made some very strong statements and put his money where his mouth was for um, related to the, the murder of George Floyd and, and, and much of the, the work that was right. thinking about economic empowerment. So it changes the conversation. We, you know, if we were to look at uh, the numbers, <laughs> uh, I said there was five. Five represents 1% of the Fortune 500, right? So if we were to be at least equal to the number of people in the population who are, who are Black, that would be 13%. That would be 13 times what we're talking about. That would be 65. Imagine having 65 Black CEOs out there. Now, you know, people always try to throw some kind of uh, uh, meritocracy arguments. Oh, well, that means they just haven't earned it. <laughs> Look, talent is distributed equally. Access is not. And so there are plenty of, of Black executives out there and people coming through the ranks who could have the, the, what it takes to be um, the next CEO of a, of a company. And I know I'm talking about the corporate case, but we, we want to look at it more broadly than that, too. Right. A black leadership matters because of all those things. You, you, you want to have an inclusive society. We, we keep talking about these things, but um, we need to realize that there are, there, there are some things going on inside the companies that need to be addressed and fixed. And of course, lots of programs and initiatives around, along those lines. Um, but it, if we want to have this inclusive society, we need to also think about how the economy and the levers of power that go along with that economy um, are, also, uh, are also diverse. And, and we're not there yet. Uh, frankly, and that's what a lot of the work that we do. Black leadership matter, matters for those reasons and, and, yeah. and, and several others. Dr. Pinkett, as an OG born in 1945, the gospel that my foster parents preach to us was to get a good education and get a good job. That was the gospel, preferably a good government job. Things have changed. Now, we did what our parents instructed us to do. Most of us, even to this day, the overwhelming majority of us, although that's slowly but surely changing, have jobs. If you were to massage that old school saying, get a good education, get a good job. If you were to massage it for the, 20, for the, for the 21st century, how would you rephrase that? How would you, how would you say that today when talking to and teaching and modeling young people? How would you frame that? I would frame it in the words of uh, another uh, dearly departed OG, uh, Earl Graves. And Earl Graves is quoted in his book, which inspired ours. His book is Why Should White, no, no, How to Succeed in Business Without Being White. That was Earl Graves' book. <laughs> That's right. uh, and in the book, he says, your career is your own private business. Your career is your own private business. And I would layer on that what we say in our book, which is entrepreneurship is not just something you do, it's a way that you think. Mm. And it's a defining mindset for the 21st century. Unlike the mindset of getting a job, the mindset of an entrepreneur is about creating value and creating wealth. Uh, and not every entrepreneur is seeking to create wealth. You could be a social entrepreneur who is looking to affect societal change, although some might say that is another, another, another form of wealth. Yeah. Uh, uh, and Dr. Robinson is an expert in this in this space, in fact. Mm -hmm. uh, but but I, I would I would frame it uh, along those lines, which is uh, you you have a quote too. I'm, I'm I'm over here quoting left and right, George, that I love, where you said either pursue your dreams or somebody else will pay you to pursue theirs. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's, that's right up on my wall. <laughs> that's right. It's one of my five rules. That, that, that's exactly so you got two choices. Um, <laughs> now, obviously, the latter, the former is more empowering. Uh, 
Right. And so I, I think the message to our young people was fortunately, someone sold us that Kool-Aid at a very young age. That's true. Uh, like we caught the entrepreneurship bug at the ages of 19 and 20. And I'm, and I'm grateful every day that we, were, that we were sold that glass of Kool-Aid. Right. Uh, but the message has to be there are young people uh, that getting a job is subservient to creating jobs. You can laud these high paid athletes as much as you want, but if they're getting paid that much, that means somebody else is getting paid more to pay them that much. That's right. um, so you can be a, a consumer or you can be a producer. You make the choice. But know this, in the words of, of Dr. George Frazier, if you're not the one producing, then someone's making money off your consumption. And that's got to be the message. That, that's, that's and, and, and last thing I'll say is, uh, and we break that down in the book, strategic actions seven and eight in the book are based on the same mindset of an entrepreneur. Strategic action seven is thinking act like an entrepreneur within an established organization. Right. Strategic action eight is think and act like an entrepreneur, which is to create a new organization and create value and create wealth. That's right. Even working in the public or pri private sector as an employee, what they're really looking for you to think about and to perform is to be entrepreneurial in your thinking, mm -hmm. even if you are employed by someone today, right? Right. right? No, no question. Dr. Robbins, you, yes, you are an expert in this, in, in this particular area, in many other areas, but this particular area, mm -hmm. you can add anything you want to, 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 to these insights, please. Well, I'm so glad you gave me that chance because I was thinking to myself, Boy, I'd like to add three or four things to that. <laughs> I, 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 I saw you over there smiling. I said, oh, he's, he's a ham sandwich here. Oh, wow. Well, so so just to, to go one step further uh, than what uh, Dr. Pinkett was just saying, you know, I, I talk to young people these days. I say, hey, you know, you can you can be an employee. Uh, so I've, I know that's, that's, a, that's a route that a lot of you have been told. Same thing that I was told. But you, you need to think about how wealth is created in America. And you need to think about um, the, other, the other options that can be run in parallel or in, in many cases, you, know, you, you are navigating back and forth between uh, investments, various types of investments. Um, and then whether it's self-employment or some kind of business ownership, you're, you are triangulating. You know, we've gone back and forth. And, and many times we've done these things in parallel. Sure, we, we used to have corporate jobs, but we were running a business on the side. Yeah. <laughs> right. uh, you know, I know a lot of people are getting into investing and as their, their approach to wealth creation, and that's great, you know, whether that's real estate or go, going in the stock market. But it, one of the things we've, we've realized is that if you are just an employee, now don't, don't take that out of context, people like, oh, I'm, I'm a great employee, great. But if you are just the, the, the person who is producing for someone else, not navigating it as it with entrepreneurial thinking, um, then you are, are, are selling yourself short because now you, you don't have as many vehicles for creating that wealth that you want to pass on to the next generation. Sure. Those are the things that we as a community need to do much more of. Uh, and, and we, you know, again, we try to outline that uh, in the books so that people get it. Uh, that the, you, you've got to be thinking about uh, multiple streams of income, certainly, but also double go. and triple bottom lines. It's not just about you making money. It's also about what are you doing for the community? What are you doing for the, the environmental justice? Right. Um, you know, the, the Stokely Carmichael quote that you had earlier, it really is a theme of, of what we talked about in the book, yeah. because we are always talking about it. Um, and living it, but we've also documented it, that you've got to be thinking about yeah. how you, what you're doing is going to make an impact uh, on uh, the, the broader uh, Black community and, and beyond. Yeah, and, and it's, that, it's that level of consciousness that has to be uh, infused in succeeding generations. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to send you that, I'm going to email you that, that quote, you can, um, you can uh, frame it and put it up on your wall. I, and I really mean it, it was the North Star for my personal existence, right? And now it took me a, a little while to man up uh, and to 
truly understand the impact of that. Um, and as I got my head screwed on straight, because, you know, even I started, I, I didn't start my entrepreneurial journey until 42 years old, after 20 years in the public and private sector, Procter & Gamble, United Way, Ford Motor Company. And then I got my head, you know, handed to me and, and ultimately screwed on right. Um, the next question is, 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 um, but really both of you, I know people who have read the book, uh, but you can share at least two strategic actions that black professionals should take. Both of you, two strategic actions that black people should take in a sense, maybe as part of their North Star for the 21st century. Yeah, love it, love it, love it. So the, the 10 strategic actions in the book are cumulative. Uh, each strategic action builds upon its predecessors. Now it's, and, and the visual that we depict in the book is actually uh, a black, two black professionals, a, a, a black woman and a black man uh, climbing up a, a mountain. It's, uh, it's both metaphoric uh, and thematic relative to the themes of the book. Uh, and so the first strategic action is the most foundational of the 10, and that is self-determination, self-determination. Now, some see that in, in, in a business book and say, well, you, you talking about Kwanzaa? What, what you got self-determination <laughs> in a book? But Dr. Frazier, you get it, like you get it. Here's what we're saying. Long before you get to the top, strategic action 10, if you don't know who you are, That's if right. you don't know where you're going, by the time you get there, it's too late. Right. That ship has already set sail right. on the foundational, introspective, inner work of understanding who you are, what you stand for, what direction you're headed, what your agenda is, your values. Like All of that has to happen long before you get to the top. That's why we start with strategic action one. That's right. Now I'll jump. I'll, I'll, I'll give Dr. Robinson the baton by staying with the early uh, strategic actions, give him the later ones. But strategic action three, which Dr. Robinson gifted me the ideas of strategic action three, talks about self-mastery and meaning, finding meaning. Mm. And we offer up this, this powerful framework that Dr. Robinson uh, gifted me called Ikigai. Uh, it's a Japanese framework, and it, the translation means uh, meaning, sense of purpose. And it talks about these four intersecting circles around what are you good at, what do you love to do, what's the world looking for, and what can you get paid to do, right? Think about those four. What do you love to do? What are you good at doing? Uh, what's the world looking for? What's the world looking for, and what can you get paid? Like, find the intersection of those four and somewhere in that intersection is your ikigai your meaning and it's a it's a it's a powerful construct for how we uh navigate and negotiate that's a good word negotiate what god's gifted us with what the world is seeking in terms of our value and our meaning so strategic action one self-determination strategic action three uh, self-mastery and meaning. And I'll pass the baton to Dr. Okay. Robinson. Dr. Robinson. <laughs> yeah, those are two, two great ones and, and they're foundational. So it, when I think about um, you know, how the, and I know we've talked a bit about this already, how the entrepreneurship comes into the book, it, it's in strategic action seven and strategic action eight. Uh, number seven is think and act like an entrepreneur. So it's the entrepreneurial mindset inside of a, of a company. That the, what we found from, again, there's research that, that we've done, research that we've also cited in the book, talk about people being entrepreneurial, that the leaders, the true leaders of companies are the folks who are using those kinds of entrepreneurial skills um, as they go about uh, their business inside of the company. Uh, that um, has lots of not only value building uh, types of activities, but we also put the context of uh, thinking about the double bottom line, as I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the things as a theme throughout our book is that we see 
our ethnicity, our blackness as an asset, not a liability. When you walk into that room, even though you may be the only one or one of a few in that room, you have a perspective, a certain sense of cultural capital that you're bringing to the table. And knowing that, understanding that helps you to think about how you might be able to use um, your, entrepreneurial, um, your entrepreneurial skills inside of a company uh, to not only help the bottom line, the financial bottom line for the company, but also think about how you might direct some of those resources um, and those opportunities uh, back to the black community or other communities of color. Uh, so that's one of the, 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 the themes there. And then the, the second one there goes with, it is think and act like an entrepreneur. We go deep on entrepreneurship. And one of the things that we point out is that um, when we look at the BE100, we can tell you some stories. You can look at good to great or, or breakthrough companies. These are you know, way companies that have, have gone through the test of time and have made certain, certain decisions, strategic decisions along the way. We go into detail about what some of those decisions are uh, for entrepreneurs, because everybody's not gonna stay inside the, the company, much like you just described with your own, your own history. Um, we often, and I, I see it a lot, we get to a certain level or we get to a certain place in the company, we say, you know, I think I can go out on my own. Well, going out on your own is, is fine, but it doesn't build uh, wealth without having a team and have not only having a team, but a team that can work together to build an enterprise that can do uh, the work that we're talking about. And whether you're building it for uh, a profit and wealth building or whether you're building it for a social impact, um, the, the, the mechanisms of how you do that are the things, some of the things we talk about in the book. And we give examples of, of across all those dimensions. So yeah, I get excited about those two chapters um, because um, the examples tell the story. You know, we, we, we either have interviewed or we profile, you know, the notables, people that we know. We, we have these wonderful interviews with both Kathy Hughes and Bob Johnson. And to, to hear the stories about how they grew their companies, uh, some of the challenges they met, the mentors that they had, um, even the possibilities of merging that was talked about at one time. And, and it, it is, they're amazing stories, uh, but also there are so many lessons that can be derived from it. And that's what we try to, to distill in the book. Yeah. Let's just touch on leadership a little bit. Um, one of the things I say is that leaders don't build businesses, they build people and people build businesses. What, what do you think and I'd like to hear from both of you, are the core qualities of a productive, effective, successful leader of businesses and people? So I, I'm a big believer in servant leadership. Mm -hmm. and, and I think about three characteristics in particular of a, of a servant leader in the context of business. There's lots of other characteristics, but three come to mind from a business perspective. Uh, one is empowering others to do their best and be their best. Uh, serving them to enable them mm. to shine their light, the absolute brightest that it possibly can shine. Um, second, and arguably most important of the three, humility. And not just humility from uh, a, a personality perspective, but being transparent, being forthcoming, and being vulnerable about what you don't do well, about what you don't know, about the mistakes that you make. Because when you are transparent about all of those things, you liberate others to do the same. Uh, and then third, is holding people accountable for what they can control. Let me say it differently. Not mm. letting folk get away with stuff while other folk are watching. In other words, you're able to have honesty and integrity. Honesty is conforming your words to your actions. Integrity is conforming your actions to your words. Mm. And so when I see inappropriate behavior, when I see someone cutting inappropriate corners, I see something, I say something, and then people know where I stand as a leader on these matters of principle rather than popularity. Powerful. Dr. Robinson, you want to comment? 
I, I just want to add one thing to what he said. That was yeah. that was, that was yeah, he was all over that. Yeah. <laughs> he sucked all all, of that. Hey, Dr. Robinson, he sucked all the air out of the room. I don't know. <laughs> he, he, he does that a lot. He does that a lot. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but the one thing I would add is that, and it came across in lots of the interviews with the leaders we talked about. Leadership at the highest level is also about amplified action. Um, which is something we talk about in, in the book. It's about thinking about how you're collaborating with others uh, to, towards these towards these goals. And what I I am dubious about are those leaders who do it all by themselves and don't think that a team that and partners and collaborators are are necessary. You can only get so far with that kind of thinking. And we, you know, we've for years have been, you know, the, the folks hitting the drum that says it, it, you can't do this stuff alone, not for the kinds of impact that we're talking about, not for the kinds of enterprises we're talking about, you're not for the kinds of, of you know, of, of world changing, transforming systems type of, of leadership, you've got to realize and understand how uh, leadership can be used and should be used to find that synergy that transforms systems. That to me is sort of the, the, the next level of, of uh, we've got a lot of folks doing their leadership um, for themselves. And so, you know, they, they may not be the servant leaders that Dr. Pinkett was talking about. Mm -hmm. It's when you figure out ways uh, to collaborate with one another that uh, some real progress is made. Powerful. Um, A question that I want to ask is about emerging opportunities for Black folk in terms of entrepreneurial spheres of, of, of uh, or business spaces that we should be looking at seriously. And, and I, I think we have enough barbecue joints, barbershops, and beauty salons. I ain't hating on them. God bless them. You know, I visit one of our barbecue uh, uh, stores uh, at least twice a week. So I'm not advocating they go out of business. I'm just saying, where are the new opportunities in the 21st century? If you were going to recommend a young brother or sister to look into various new business opportunity spaces, what would be those spaces? Well, either one, both. No, no, I'm, I'm happy to jump in. And, and I know you're, you know, right. you're, you're, you're certainly being proactive, uh, George, on, on this very question. Um, right. I mean, you, you have to think about uh, uh, cryptocurrency, uh, it's not going anywhere anytime soon. You got to think about uh, all things healthcare, because uh, like one out of one out of every three dollars uh, is spent on healthcare. I mean, that, that's an astonishing number right there. One out of every three dollars is spent on something wow. that relates uh, to healthcare. Um, you got to think about artificial intelligence and all of its branches: machine learning, uh, natural language processing, and, and and let me say that a little differently. Uh, Every technology becomes more accessible to the masses. There was a day when you had to learn how to code to build a website. Mm -hmm. Now it is highly accessible. It's drag and drop. It's not even point and click. It's drag and drop. Um, and so uh, AI is coming to your doorstep for your, to power your business, to predict what your customers want, um, to forecast demand that you couldn't have forecasted. Otherwise, the list goes on and on and on. So healthcare... Uh, cryptocurrency, uh, all things AI, uh, for me, are the are three big areas. And the, and the fourth thing I'll say is, and it's not exactly kind of an industry, but I think we also have to acknowledge that in the uh, pandemic era that we're living in, thinking very deeply about uh, what new opportunities emerge with us spending more time virtually and at home. Um, the pandemic created clear winners and clear losers. Winners, uh, paper towels, hand sanitizer, uh, delivery to your door, all, all big winners, losers, movie theaters, airlines, hotels, uh, you know, uh, you know, so, so, there, 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 so there, there's some industries that have been, that have been born 
that are going to create some really big winners in this pandemic era. Think deeply about what that might mean for what you do or what you're not doing. Mm -hmm. Metaverse. Where's the entry point for us in the metaverse? You hear a lot of conversation about this. What is that really? And where's the business opportunity? Jeffrey, Randall? Well, you know, the metaverse is, is this whole virtual world that uh, Facebook, which you know, used to be Facebook, now it's meta. They, they are uh, really uh, engaged in, certainly through their virtual reality headsets and, and the like, but they're not the only ones in there. Uh, right. This metaverse is an alternate reality. And the, 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 the thought is that people are going to spend more time in these, these virtual worlds. And uh, as time goes on, we're going to spend more and more time for entertainment, for connection. Uh, no, you won't leave your house. You'll be, you'll be in this, this virtual world. But what makes it uh, interesting from a business standpoint is not just the establishment of this virtual space. It's that they will be doing things inside this space that, is, that, that are... Um, that people are going to pay for. So the opportunities are inside this virtual space for entertainment, um, for, for experiences. People are looking for different experiences and not even you know, being uh, leaving, leaving their, their, their basement. And those uh, people are going to be paying for them or licensing those things, or uh, they're going to be you know, involved in uh, providing those those kinds of those kinds of space, so it, it can't be one company in there. You might say, right, right. so there's a, there's the on ramp. You know, where somebody has to create the the space for this to happen in, but inside of that space, there are going to be all of these different um, venues, places for people to go, and that you know that just blows my mind that we're that we're there. You know, this is, these are the things of of movies, uh, of of science fiction, and now you know, we're talking about. Uh, you know this this all being part of uh, the of, of our world now yeah and, and we're sort of getting a little taste to that because we're being black folks are being a bit proactive in non-fungible tokens That's right That's you know, putting right. their products and services in various packages I mean it, it sounds very evocative and provocative and maybe even unaccessible but it really isn't as complicated as it sounds so there will be new opportunities for merchandising and 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 and, and doing business in a very very uh, non-conventional way absolutely yeah, I mean, it's, it's an exciting world that we're living in. You two are going to live another two generations in this world. I can't even imagine what it will look like a generation or two from now. So um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a bit envious. I wish I could say I'll be around two generations from now, but that's not likely. Um, uh, we, we're running out of time. I just want to ask a couple of uh, simple questions. I surmise you met, the both of you met in college. Was it college or was it before college? It and how did you meet in college? It was the first week at Rutgers University, both engineering students. And we met um, at the meeting for the national, the Rutgers chapter of the National Society of Black Engineers. Turned around, you know, meet somebody that you haven't met before, and first week of classes, that was uh, the meeting where I turned around and saw this tall, skinny brother and said, he looks like me. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, well, so, uh, Randall, what, what was the glue? I mean, you met a lot of people, right? But, but here you are, you have this lifelong friendship. Not, not only are you friends, but you're business partners. You, 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 you know, you learn from each other, you model for each other, you inspire each other. I mean, that's a special relationship. Very few of those kind of relationships exist in our life. What was the thing that bonded you, the glue? I, I, I say it simply uh, that we are like-minded and like-hearted. Uh, we, uh, we're, very similar in many in many ways, and and our, and our upbringings are, are are very similar as well in terms of being born in cities and moved to suburbs and being that black face in a white place for all of our years coming up, uh, academic achievers, and and all of what 
allowed us to arrive on the campus of Rutgers University, but that's, that's the head. Uh, the heart really is a, a set of, 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 of shared values as both being Christian men, uh, a shared commitment to community, uh, a shared commitment to family, uh, this faith and belief in one another. And, 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 and at the end of the day, uh, a, a deep and abiding love for one another that we've cultivated over, over three decades. Uh, I admire this brother. He's a, he's a role model and a friend. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, somebody I look up to and somebody to whom I look. And, 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 and here's the last thing I gotta say, and this is not to be lost because you've seen this George and your travels with other entrepreneurs and the like, and there's no ego. You know, <laughs> I mean, like we're not trying to, no one's envious, no one's jealous, no one's trying to one up the other. We might have friendly competitions. I mean, we both have five degrees, and, you know, and one of us, <laughs> one of us is thinking we might go get a sixth one to beat the other. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's beautiful. Um, a, 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 a final question. Um, Black faces in high places is going to have a challenge. Tell us about the challenge. We've got a couple of minutes left. Tell us about the Black Faces in High Places challenge. Either one of you can answer. Jeffrey, you want to you want to talk about it? Or well, I'll, I'll start it off. I'm sure Dr. Pinkett will improve on it. Look, you know, we know it's Black History Month. We said well, we need to challenge people to to highlight the the Black faces in high places that they admire. And so, what we've asked. Um, the folks who are listening to our voice to do and those who follow us on social media is we challenge them uh, to post a picture of someone who they admire, who they learn from, um, who is, as we call it, a black face in a high place, someone who has achieved a certain level of, of prominence. That to me um, starts the, the chain. We, you, 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 you nominate, you, you show that picture, then you nominate some other folks who should do the same and we keep the chain going. To, show, to highlight black excellence. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, it has been an honor. I mean, I mean that sincerely. Uh, I have never had this opportunity to talk to you both at the same time publicly in a global platform. I, you know, when I was moving around as you were talking because I cannot. I cannot listen to you and not take notes. So I was looking for my pens so I could write some notes down. It is always a pleasure. Keep doing God's work. Um, you are a gift to our people. Um, you're at genius level. Uh, you're not alone, but you're in rare air. We love you. Stay safe. Stay the course. Keep doing the right things and all that is due you will come to you. So thank you so much for your time. Love you both. Mm -hmm.